This week I'm joined by Vera Buhlmann, who is a professor of architecture theory and director of the Department for Architecture Theory and Philosophy of Technics at Vienna University of Technology. Her latest monograph is entitled Information and Mathematics in the Philosophy of Michel Serre. In this episode, we discuss Michel Serre's text, The Incandescent. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermetics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Vera Bulman, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about Michel Serre's text, The Incandescent. Um, but before we jump in on that, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, and um, where you first came across the work of uh, Michel Serre. Yes, with pleasure. <laughs> I um, originally studied uh, English literature and language, and it was very early in my uh, in my studies that I encountered in the little booklet where Serre wrote the preface. It's called in German. It's called Beginnings. It's a booklet by um, Prigozhin and Isabel Stengers on thermodynamics. <clears throat> and in that um, introductory text, Serre wrote something that has troubled me very much <laughs> while studying literature. He said, we have lost the world in black ink on white paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I loved language because I felt it makes the world rich. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is somebody writing so poetically and so eloquently um, basically saying something like this about language and writing. And I still don't think I fully get what he means and how he means that, but that was my first encounter. And then much later, after I finished my, uh, my first studies uh, in, in uh, language and literature and philosophy and media, media studies, um, when I turned to uh, to media studies to do my PhD, Serb again became very important because he was such a voice outside of the media studies um, discourses. So it was not quite the materialism of the Kittler school, and it was also not quite this kind of um, epistemological um, axiomatic approach to language. But in my PhD, I had no chance to really work with Serre because there was always this um, silence, how to speak about him, <laughs> what to do with what he says. It, it was so difficult to, to link it to discourses which are already there, unless to use it in a kind of an instrumental point to claim a, a space of reservation or something like that. And then after I did my PhD, I started to work with architects. Um, and information um, theory, information technology in architecture. And of these computational approaches then, there was a great, great interest in artificial intelligence procedures like feature extraction and mapping procedures, algorithms. And it was then that I realized how important inform mathematical information theory is to serve. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially this, uh, this, this, uh, this couple of concepts of entropy and negentropy, which in information theory is not the same like in thermodynamics. <laughs> and then this is what I, what, I, uh, what I worked a lot about. This allowed me to, 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 uh, to really look at um, the computer as an algebraic machine, primarily, not a calculator. <laughs> and then through this, I came... Uh, from a very different side to the romantic traditions in cultural studies, in literature, in philology. And it uh, basically opened up uh, a super nice, extremely wide new terrain. And this was around 2010. And then I, since then I have been working uh, again and again a lot on Serre. I, um, he helped me to teach this kind of humanities background to students who were not so much interested in the humanities, who wanted to do real things, yeah, the architect, mm -hmm. um, because it was such an uncharted uh, domain, but not only in terms of discourse politics, but also because it allowed to make connections which, uh, which, which would not fall into these um, stereotypical anti, uh, yeah, like are you with culture or are you with nature, are you with the object or are you with the subject? It was possible to be much more uh, subtle about all of these things. 
And then last year, no, actually this year, um, my monograph, it's the, my first after my PhD who came out on Michel Serre, where I tried to find ways of uh, speaking to a wider community about this this different relation between mathematics and information that we have in Serre. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I jot down there, what is the difference between um, entropy and negentropy in, in information theory and in thermodynamics what's the key difference <laughs> yeah that's the hardest one <laughs> it has to do with um, everything in the book we're talking about the incandescent um very so the 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 key terms are it's this character of you know, information and in information theory is neither matter nor energy so this is um, the classic formulation which is not very elucidating, <laughs> but it's kind of keeping a reservation, which is important. And in thermodynamics, everything is, is, uh, is, is discussed in terms of uh, the differences in temperatures. Mm -hmm. And what comes in with information theory is a temporality that goes together with differences in temperatures. And it is this temporality which um, also very much interested um, people in, in uh, before molecular biology was invented to make use for not only for chemistry, so for the inanimate or the material domain, but for living systems, for life organisms. And then there was a complicated and uh, a history of how the term entropy became a kind of an um, oper operational term through complementing it with its negative. And this, from a logical point of view, is is a, is is, is a, a bit of an absurdity because, of course, the entropy ultimately is related to the dissolution of all the differences. So then, how can we, or what, where are we talking when we are saying there is negatives to that, and not only one but many? And this term of uh, neg entropy um, really marked the differences between, for example, the theories of Shannon and Wiener, and then especially Leon Brilouillat, who is the reference that uh, Serre foreground so much, not as a kind of a dialectical synthesis of the of the electroengineering notions, but as a natural philosophy, basically. I think we're, uh, entropy and neg entropy will come back in, but I like to start with the hermetics question um so you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the question uh who do you who do you pick yeah i would i would uh, of course pick Ser right now and i would imagine a conversation he would have with um georg steiner he's a uh, I'm not sure. I always, I always perceived him, but I never before I read him, <laughs> as a kind of um, theological scholar, not working in theology. And um, yeah, I never really read him until very recently. Now he has this book after Babel, mm -hmm. where he goes through the development of uh, linguistics or language studies since the 19th century, especially, but before the background of all these uh, hermetic and, um, and, and theological notions of uh, deciphering and, and communicating. And I would love to hear how they talk together about the chronopedia. <laughs> so this uh, idea in Serre that we place knowledge in counted time. Yeah, so in, in temporality, so not chronology, <laughs> but kind of an objectification of the counting of time, which contains or which accommodates knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think they would have a super interesting conversation about this. And then the third person I imagine in that room would be Emmy Nutter. And Emmy Nutter is a mathematician, but she was not officially one, mm -hmm. so she was... Uh, not allowed to study and so on, but uh, Hilbert, the formalist <laughs> mathematician, he gave her his seminar so she could teach in his name. Mm -hmm. And she basically was the first scholar who really made use of, um, of Dedekind, a 19th century mathematician, who is kind of like the father of structuralism, we could say, in a, uh, in a way which always brought it not so much to epistemology and logics and analytical philosophy, but close to physics. And she was uh, then the one, the, the, the one um, yeah, intellectual who reformulated the laws of nature into laws of conservation. Mm -hmm. And that's a um, huge thing. So that because the, the, the Newtonian system of the laws of nature 
are of course directed, but indefinitely so. So it's a linear, uh, infinitesimal kind of uh, a progress. And to reformulate this into into laws that would be conserving, but be able to do the same is a, is a, is a huge step. So I would very much like to imagine her in the room with Steiner and with Serre, overhearing the conversation and helping them to give uh, mathematical uh, formulations for how to turn this interest in the chronopedia into a quantum literacy. <laughs> so you're, you're, do you think that the, uh, the math- mathematical parts of Sarah are sort of over, overlooked? Or do you think that- they're um, maybe a bit concealed? Very much so, yes. But it's not only the mathematical thinking in Serre, it's it's uh, basically mathematics at large, almost, in the in the 20th century, especially after the wars. So there is a, like theoretical institutes of mathematics, they are hardly ever existing anymore, very, very few. And if they are, they, they're usually attached or very closely linked to nuclear physics and to really the, 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 yeah, the uncanny, the serious side of science. So it's not in popular fashion anymore. And what is in popular fashion is a logical foundation of mathematics. Okay, so if you want to study mathematics now, it has to be sort of striated into a, a certain institution or for a reason as opposed for itself. Yeah, because mathematics always had this or has this proximity to theology no, and to the spiritual, because ultimately in mathematics, you are dealing with the infinite and with, uh, with, with, with boundaries that are um, not, yeah, not just discursive, <laughs> with, with the most abstract concepts there are. And this kind of investigation into mathematics is... Um, is, is, is very much um, disinhibited, is that the right word? So people are not, um, there is not an invitation to go in these directions. Oh, I see. Because um, it's contradicting with the, with the secular paradigm of science in which we are. The, the what, which paradigm, sorry? The secular, so the oh, social science uh, and the secular. Okay. And then oh, if there is a, a space for the spiritual or for the indefinite, we want to see it in arts as the other two science today. Um, that actually brings me to another thing. The, the first thinker you mentioned, Steiner, you mm-hmm. mentioned that he had a hermetic outlook. Do you believe that there's there could be a potential hermetic reading of um, Ser? Because there's, there's sort of infamously Joshua Ramey's book, The Hermetic Deleuze. But when I read Ser, I see m- many of the same traits, especially from, um, you know, one of the sort of hermetic underpinnings is the idea of constant change. And this is a big theme in Sarah. Do you think that there's a, the, the link there is that with Sarah, we, we could have a hermetic Sarah in a certain sense? <laughs> well, I don't think I would agree to call him um, directly as continuing the hermetic tradition, <laughs> but certainly um, somebody who is not afraid to, in a way, refer back to the fascinations behind the hermetic, but also the Gnostic, and also I don't, I'm not too firm in the in the in the distinctions really between the very different traditions of how to engage with um, with dark meanings. So. There, there are many different ones, and I wouldn't be sure which one really there would have to be associated with. I think it's more an interest in uh, in giving. No, so in my, in my reading of Ser, the, um, there is something cryptic always that we cannot go behind, on every level. Even when he when he when he makes this uh, this uh, Le Grand Russie, which starts from the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is interesting because it says whatever might have been before, we cannot address it positively. We cannot address it in science. So it doesn't need to cancel it out or to throw it off the table, but it also doesn't really affirm, in my understanding, one um, yeah, spiritual commitment to how to engage with it. Okay. Um, so mo- moving into the incandescent, um, I understand I haven't sent you this question. It's quite a big question. But in comparison to some of his other texts, so with the parasite, you sort of, you know, you're going to have this focus on the parasite. Um, the birth of physics is uh, based around his readings of Lucretian atomism and, and early forms of physics. With the incandescent, it's um, even for Sarah, it's a bit more spontaneous. Um, how would you exp- how do you explain this book? And pa- perhaps you think I'm incorrect. Perhaps it is a bit more coherent than I. There's something there that I've completely missed, maybe. 
Yeah, I think I actually think it is very coherent, but um, mainly I started to to see it exactly through reading Steiner now, basically. So what what there is, um, I think, taking or placing in this notion of the incandescent, which he takes from a natural uh, philosopher of the, I think, 18th century, it's Buffon, Lord Buffon, who um, introduced this notion of the incandescent uh, as a kind of a, an, a, a deep time, yeah? a deep time, a notion of a deep time, which, which, uh, which establishes a, a, almost a virtual kind of contemporaneity between different um, materializations. So his, his book was one of the first who began to write a history of nature that wouldn't follow the biblical um, calendar anymore. Mm -hmm. and, but it also didn't contradict the biblical calendar. So it basically uh, said that the, the steps, the hermeneutic depth of reading the scriptures has a material equivalent, which is this incandescent quality that he gave to, to matter as well. So with, when Serre is uh, picking up this notion now, for me, it's, it's really a kind of a synthesis of his, um, of his oeuvre. So it includes issues and interest in the parasite, which are more on the social science side, as well as his uh, studies in, on Leibniz and architectonics in mathematics and so on. Mm -hmm. And with this notion of the incandescent in relation to time, I think these are some of the most beautiful passages of Serre I've ever read, especially when just paraphrase I think I can roughly paraphrase it when he's talking about if someone's breathing could be so fast that a mountain range would the entropy of a mountain range would disintegrate it you know in a moment but if someone's breathing was so slow that you know the blossoming of a rose would take an eternity and it's this idea of uh, separating out the levels of temporality yeah. into the moments that you actually can inherently deal with as a subject in their own frame and just understand them as their own moment um, but for me, it was interesting that do you think that these levels of temporality where there's the time of a mountain range and the time of a rose blossoming are vastly different. Are these sort of do these sort of mirror his idea of levels of communication in that our understanding of these is only approximate to our understanding of the level which they are working within? But to put it very simply, if we understand all objects and all moments within the same temporal frame of reference, we mm -hmm. lose it. We're losing something quite big there. Mm -hmm. Yes, in that sense, yes, very much. But the difficulty is that there's um, already to speak of levels of temporality and also levels of communication is following this kind. So what what Steiner calls an axiomatic fiction. <laughs> And because we can only quantify time if we kind of anchor it into a notion of space. Mm -hmm. So the two are not independent. And um, Serre beautifully, I mean, I love the passage you just cited. <laughs> but another one I also really love a lot is how he opens the book with this uh, site in the mountains mm -hmm. where there is the little girl playing with the doll protected by her father standing in front of a house. And then what he does is he unfolds a kind of an escalation, which does the opposite of what escalation usually does, namely to accelerate everything into a common rush. And the kind of ex escalation that he articulates there does the opposite. It slows down time because it begins to discretize different temporalities. So then the girl, is, his point is that there's always somebody in the back supporting the experience of time that is proper to a thing or to a, to a yeah, he expands it. And he says the father has uh, the security of the house, which was already built when he started to live there. Then the house has the security of the materials, which are gathered from the, from, from the location. The location has the support of the river, which brings the materials from the mountain top and so on. So it's really an escalation where there is always a kind of a cut in time, which is relative then to a particular um, temporality that is uh, characteristic of uh, a point of focus, let's say. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a, a utility in this understanding for Sarah, for the subject, if we begin to under, if we begin to perceive the world? in this way or attempt to perceive the world in this way these 
um, as you stated, the escalations of temporality or the escalation where do you think there's something that can be understood in the relation between, for instance, in, in the relation between a mountain and the toy? When we begin to understand the relation between them, do you think there's something in that for Sarah which is quite important? Yeah, so I think the notion of the subject which he foregrounds in that book is uh, the notion of a universal subject. So it's not a subject that would be defined vis-a-vis -vis an object directly, mm -hmm. but it's always the complexity that an object enfolds or manifests, which needs to unfold for a subject to become a little bit more universal if it's capable to relate to that. So it's, it's um, I mean, ultimately, the, what, so he has this one passage where he says, time gives us a new notion of equality among all things. And this would include the doll, as well as the river, as well as the mountain, as well as the magma even, as well as the sun. <laughs> so really going through all the scales of temporalities. And this um, equality now is not because time predicts or predicates our actions, but because um, we are all of universal age. So the, the DNA basically <clears throat> interiorizes or manifests the history of the universe mm -hmm. on, a, on a molecular and on an atomic level. Mm -hmm. So there is a, what makes everything equal is, is, a, is, a, is a notion of ageness because it's desenectute. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's really of old age. <clears throat> and this, um, yeah, this, this is, has enormous implications to think like that. Because in many ways, then age is not something that we develop or grow towards as we grow up, but that we kind of um, recover or go deep or source from a kind of an interiority that is not properly ours individually then. So where's, um, how could you explain this interiority? Well, he has this um, very striking picture always that uh, the DNA, you know, I mean, we, we, so it's it's quite common to make uh, a bit of uncomfortable fun <laughs> when we say that uh, hardly anything differs humans from other species, you no, know, from apes, but also uh, on a material level, then from even from minerals, from rocks, from from all kinds of things. So um, this interiority has something to do with the capacity. And that is maybe a good point to bring it back to the beginning with this interest in language. Mm -hmm. That language always at one and the same time can make us at home in a kind of a mental space at least, but it also alienates us because in language we are never just reconfirmed. <laughs> so the home is always under erosion, so to speak. And this kind of, this capacity of, of uh, giving comfort at the same time as alienating. Mm -hmm. This role, I think, he, he, he transfers it through his, what I call a physics of communication. He transfers it from language, where we have always attributed it, to, um, to this kind of uh, time, of deep time. Yeah? But it's not only deep time, it's... Uh, yeah, it's very difficult to, 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 to speak of it. So the, the way to speak of it that he proposes is to say these escalations, we need to think notions of scale for these escalations. And scale is not always already placed in a dimensional space, but rather it, it engenders dimensionality. And this, this, we've already got into this inherent paradox within Ser, which is his sort of turbulent love-hate relationship with language as the means to explain something, but simultaneously in explaining it with language mm -hmm. you are removing the other sensual essence of it so it's getting mm -hmm. um sort of wrapped in language but you're you're losing other aspects of it by explaining it and it seems to me that especially with him he works with Kant a lot in this book um not too cryptically quite overtly for Serre and with who? With uh, who? Uh, Emmanuel Kant in in the incandescent, I I, I <laughs> he doesn't mention him, but I, I I read him I read him as working with Kant in this, book. Mm -hmm. especially in terms of the idea of in terms of language, the idea of our history is an artificial representation of time, and I saw says, well I read says thoughts on the idea of deep 
deeper levels of time as a way to even within the place space of phenomena as a way to explore that phenomena outside of its own bounds so when he starts talking about the idea of i'm sure he mentions getting to the thing in itself by way of um a connection to memory so we still retain something of the thing in itself even though it's gone and by doing that we we do have a form of a sort of connection to memory the main the main question here is sort of about history and what the the artificial idea of the artificial history we've created do you think for say that is primarily language based and it's actually quite risky to understand everything through that form of history yeah now i can see what you mean um <clears throat> Uh, yes. So one of his, this is now mainly in another book um, about Napoleon and the Samarites. I forgot, I forgot the precise title, but it's, it's a book where he is very, really angry against, I mean, it pops up in many of his books, but he's very angry against the statues that we give history uh, in our philosophy, mainly because this uh, precise notion of history needs to start with the appearance of written documents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, so this is what he uh, really perceives as, a, 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 yeah, completely inadequate. Mm-hmm. And um, the larger interest <clears throat> to bring a kind of a, a natural communication, a physical communication, that is um, even prior to. I mean, the, he has a passage in a, in this text, the origin of language, yeah, where it is rather language that if we want to say so, engenders or brings forth the human rather than the human inventing language. Mm-hmm. But this is a notion of language which is, uh, which is um, yeah, an information theoretical, a communicative uh, notion of, of language. Mm-hmm. So, so not one which is primarily reflective and conceptual, but one which is uh, more related to speech than writing, basically. Mm-hmm. So, so that in speech, on, on the level of speech, there is in language a way of dealing with a kind of a chronometry, also of, of rhythms and of temporalities that don't work via semantic um, reference or representation, but that very much structure uh, cognition. No? So then history, the question is not so much, is it an artificial history or not? The question is more, why should history uh, yeah, be engendered by the humans and start with them. So he's very polemical. He says, "Do then cultures which have never, um, which have never uh, um, brought forth a written culture to, to 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 keep their integrity, to base their traditions in, are they not having a history or what?" Yeah. And so he's get, he's bringing this to a very concrete um, uh, levels. And on that on that level, he's very critical to language. Yes, mm-hmm. but. Um, the, the, there is, um, it, and this I think is very fundamental, there is breaking with the convention to keep form and matter categorically apart. Mm-hmm. So, so for him, the two, they're not, they cannot be reduced to either matter or to form. It's like with the Big Bang, no? So where it comes from, what was it creation? This is what we cannot speak about. But f- with regard to everything we can speak about, the two are always mixed. Okay. And this was an intra-material logician, which in English would be translated as something like software, but it's very, it's a tricky term. So it's not a logic, it's not uh, uh, directly on logos, it's more like a cryptographic treatment of, um, of logos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to be sort of um, cheeky, you don't, you don't see Sarah's dealing with Kant in this book? Not on a level of discourse politics. So in the in the in the in the uh, in the interests, of course, there are many affinities and and proximities between the two. But especially through, I mean, Serre has this notion. He develops this notion. He doesn't make it very prominent, but it's there from his early uh, from from his very early texts onwards of uh, a transcendental. But this transcendental is unlike in Kant, not um, anchored or rooted in the subject. But rather, for Serre, it is, he calls it an objective transcendental. And this has two implications because it says the transcendental itself kind of evolves. So it's not a kind of a static, uh, a determinative initial point or reference point. But it also means that um, the transcendental 
is actually being informed by how there is cognition. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so his 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 uh, his not his notion of the co of the object, which is very central. I mean, he usually doesn't. So, in my understanding, he mostly speaks of the subject with regard to this universal subject, mm -hmm. and otherwise, he wants us to think about everything as an object among objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is no unifying transcendentality that would homogenize the objects. So, the objects they all incorporate something cryptic which is not exhaustively explicit in the form that the object takes. So what um, wider implications do you think um, happen where everything is, is taken as, as an object? Is it, in what way is that an important way to perceive things for Sarah? Well, in, in um, <clears throat> this level of the transcendental in Kant, it basically attributes a place to mathematics. Yeah. So it says, with, so we, we, with mathematics, uh, we need to always, uh, so we, can, we cannot affirm mathematics, basically, <clears throat> because mathematics would bring us inevitably metaphysics back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so not a kind of a nature of empirically uh, um, falsifiable or verifiable things. And <clears throat> This relation to mathematics is reversed by uh, by the objective transcendental that Zer embraces. What is what is the consequence then is that it's not mathematics which we need to um, keep very distant and be afraid of, <laughs> but um, the log the so-called logical foundations of mathematics, because they are precisely what makes what make us lose the world in black ink on white paper. Um, yeah, moving back specifically to the incandescent, um, when we, we were we were mentioning language, and this the idea comes up again for Sarah of, of darkness and darkness and light, which are sort of darkness is more of the recurrent theme in Sarah. He he really likes the idea of the uh, the sort of black spaces that people get subsumed into and lost within because they can't can't see. And do you um, darkness? It seems to me is this place of learning for subjects which are yet to sort of illuminate it with some something else. And do you think that um, language is, where do you think language is placed for Sarah in terms of this idea of darkness and light? Uh, in in the transcendental. So and there, there I would say he's much closer to somebody like Giordano Bruno than to Kant. Because this idea that ideas cast shadows in Bruno, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. So this only works within the framework of, a, of, an, of an art of memorizing. But the memories are not subjective memories in Bruno as well. So the memories, they are, they are mentioned on the same part like objects, objects or memories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And they cast, so they are the shadows which ideas cast in the world. <laughs> That is the idea in Bruno. And then um, the, the art of memory has something to do with... Um, relating shadows to duration you know? or to say if, if objects are kind of memories that are always the shadows of ideas which are not they don't feature in the world so they would if you want maybe be something like light yeah, versus the more uh, uh, dark um, uh, domain that is uh, constituted by shadows but it's not about either identifying with the light or with the darkness but it's really on uh, uh, doing a kind of an optics of the shadows that always needs to project the ideas in order to, to read, to decipher a shadow <laughs> geometrically. It's a, it's a strange coincidence because I just, um, around two months ago, I did an episode um, on the latest translation of that exact book by uh, Bruno, uh, Di Ombre Siderum, on the shadows of the ideas. And um, it's interesting that you bring it, bring it up. The idea... That, from from what I remember, I mean, this has interesting implications because for Bruno, I always read that there is some form of a potential for a universal there because within the within every shadow was this concealed part of light. You know, there there was some form of connection mm -hmm. from the shadow. You could venture into the shadow and understand it and slowly work your way back to mm -hmm. to the light, which is a hermetic idea. But so for Sarah, do you think that the this idea of light then is 
what exactly is that in terms of knowledge? It's not, so I don't, I don't think, so given that his suggestion is that we should relate to us as subjects, always as objects among objects. So basically to not put central our, our, our social um, uh, status when we are interested in science or in knowledge. This kind of shifts the question of, in, so an interest in learning or in acquiring knowledge as somebody who wants to learn, because this is always making knowledge a property. Mm -hmm. so if I relate to knowledge in terms of where can I learn, I want to make it mine. <laughs> but this interest in, in the formal and in the mathematical in there is the opposite. So knowledge, to engage with knowledge, is always to, 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 to set knowledge free, basically. So that's also the universal of it, so that it cannot be proper. So it's universal in that sense that it doesn't belong to anything in particular. So then the place of, of what you call the place of learning would be, uh, it becomes, in my, in my thinking, it becomes more of a kind of a civic space. So not me as a political subject in a civic space, but me as somebody who is basically interested in everything else but myself. <laughs> in a civic space. It's almost there's a notion of almost kind of um, service public, no? of, of kind of a, 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 yeah, a service idea to the public that is not accommodated in a particular institution. And does that, um, does this space have an, an inherent connection to the, the incandescent? In my understanding, it does very much, yes, of course. In the so the incandescent would be a way to say, like when Bruno says there is this light in, inside of all the shadows, mm -hmm. would be, a crypt, I would call this a cryptographic treatment of the same idea. So it wouldn't want to say it's light, it says, but there is, a, there is something incandescent, now, whether it is fire or whether it is uh, pure intellect or in whichever way one wants to go when referring yeah, spirit to light, basically. I mean... Part of the problem with the language issue and history is that the 19th century very much sympathized with saying language and spirit relate. Like in more metaphysical or older traditions, people were saying light and spirit relates. And by going for the incandescent, there needs not choose between the two. Originally, it was language and spirit. No, this is uh, language and spirit. This is um, the 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 big the big change I would say in 19th century philology. Mm -hmm. where you then have a relation of, uh, so this is then very close also to Hegelianism and so on, where a spirit manifests no longer in, in light, which would be a physical magnitude mm -hmm. or um, yeah, brilliance in, in a sense of intelligence, but through language. So spirit manifests through language. This was a, a huge change in how people thought about language in the 19th century. This is really the, the, the reason I wanted to clarify that. This is really interesting for some research I'm doing at the moment. I mentioned in the questions uh, Ludwig Klagers, who's sort of slowly making this comeback, but he um, his idea was that the spirit came in and split the soul and the body. And really we should have, we should sort of, the spirit is the horrible thing which takes over and makes us ignore um, what's going on uh, in front of us, so to speak. And actually the real reality, that's sort of this... Uh, abstraction that's artificial abstraction that's created to pull us to and fro um within our reality and with with relation in relation to ser if you sort of split uh, um take the spirit as understood as as what well, the spirit within language so language is coming in and splitting us in terms of what we're doing do you think do you see something there that the language especially with ser is sort of something that comes in almost when it's not wanted and hmm. alters moments so that they become really not what they were at all. And they become <laughs> captured by another's definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, I mean, I, I'm not very well familiar with Ludwig Klages, with uh, Klages, but the way that you'd speak about it certainly triggers many resonances. And I think it would perhaps with there not so much be language itself, which comes in like that, but um, the, the untranslate, so the, the dilemma of impossible translation in language that, uh, that he kind of acknowledges by saying there is in all the things which language articulate, there remains and there is this incandescent um, 
kernel if you want or atomic um, substance or something like that mm-hmm. and, and through this there is i mean in uh, in the in, in the indian incandescent he uh, explicitly affirms uh, metaphysics again which is something very awkward after structuralism and post structuralism and and so on i mean the people who affirm metaphysics today are to my uh, awareness mainly analytical philosophers which kind of produces social metaphysics like they do social ontology so practical industrial apl- applicable uh, kind of thought structures and it's not in that sense that there is affirming it it's in a much uh, it, it's in a sense which which reconnects much more to to this um, pre enlightenment um, to this baroque and even uh, older understanding which which relates uh, light to insight primarily in a substantial kind of way and this is why the this is why communication then is important is that if we have this this light this incandescence language attempts to capture it knowledge and knowledge of it also attempts to treat it as a property which is subsumed back into language once again so we only understand it from the to say the um uh, the classical subject's point of view whereas for Serre, what's important is to step back understand the conditions of communication between everything before before venturing into specifics so it's mm-hmm. the way in which this incandescent just communicates to everything but not specifically the subject but of course he also understands that in being a human subject he gets caught up in his own language doing that that. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's why knowledge then in the chronopedia no it it comes to be the world it's not a book a particular book or a library or or a or a corpus of documents that would be separate from the world it is the world itself (laughs) Yeah, so, so there is this. Uh, so it's it's very weird because on the one hand he introduces a transcendental philosophy, mm-hmm. which he relates to a, um, a metaphysics, but it's a metaphysics which is not about identifying a substance, but one which I would say is about handling or treating whatever it might be. This substance. So it's a, it's related in for for me to his um, you know he calls himself um, a mystic of mathematics. Yeah. So so he's fascinated that through a, a mathematical articulation we can set something free, like in a in a mechanism. So everybody can do it. Everybody can relate to it, regardless in which in which historical time and regardless of who they are as individuals. So there is something impersonal. That can be, yeah, can be found, can be articulated. Could you, yeah, could you expand on the, the the mathematical side of that? Um, so, in what in what sense does mathematics help help us here to expand on this idea? You know, when you mathematics, I am in in uh, in the in the way I, I think of it is is uh, is always an um, an exterior kind of making reference. So mathematics has not really a relation to meaning because it could have any relation to meaning. No? It, it's like the mathematical notions like a unit or a number or a form or now information as well as a quantity. They, there is just not a single domain where they would not apply. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what it means that they apply is in no way settled. <laughs> so when we, when we quantify, um, when we quantify I don't know, the intensity of a strawberry flavor. It's something very different than when we count um, pillows on a bed. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So the quantification doesn't clarify what it entails to do so. It, it's not ethical in that sense. But do, do, you, do you not think that that's another form of language which might potentially um, once again remove the light? So by, by quantifying the, like you said, the... the quantifying the taste of a strawberry in doing so are we not removing ourselves from the from the actual taste only if we think of this from an individual subject point of view yeah so so maybe this is um it's a tricky it's a tricky theme right now because uh, food is becoming this new aesthetic domain but maybe it helps to relate um, more abstractly on in the level of physics you know, what, what the quantification allows is to not get into problems with contradictions mm-hmm. so 
the math so the number space of the integers mm -hmm. allowed us to understand and to describe um, how the natural forces wind and so on how they work together in windmills or in pumps or in whatever kind of mechanical devices and they remain valid even so within the domain of the infinitesimal of the real numbers, we describe the natural forces in an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. yeah? And not only in a different way, but also in a way which is much more capacious, much more powerful than the one that doesn't know the integers. Just like the integers were much more capacious than the mathematics before it accepted the zero. So, uh, but then the, 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 the ways how we describe the world through these different yeah, notions of number base or of counting, they don't contradict in a logical sense. They remain, they all remain valid, but they acquire particular temperaments maybe or capabilities, objective capabilities. I, I absolutely adore zero. So I'm going to have to have to ask, what was the implication of zero there? What, what did this alter? Well, zero um, introduced introduced uh, a kind of a symmetry into negativity. So with the zero, there uh, the, the the it was no longer an absurdity to so the the basically the one the the notion of a one or of a unity became something that can be um, modeled and articulated without without committing what is the word for this a kind of a sacrilege. Mm -hmm, yeah? mm -hmm. So, so it opened up a kind of a modeling space that was not meant to represent a thing, but to clarify our ways of how we can relate to it. So it's the, the, the zero and the, and the introduction of the, of the negative infinity that complements the positive one is a commitment to, in my reading very much, so of course it's the establishment of algebra, no, which from a logical point of view is a, is a tautology. So an equation is a tautology in algebra itself. <laughs> but when we relate to an algebraic equation in a quantification space, that is this modeling domain, we can artic so we can say, well, I call something a unity which I don't know. Yeah? So this is a kind of a speculative quantification, which is speculative precisely to provide space for the indeterminate, for that which one doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So do you think then that says understanding of mathematics would have to would have to be um after zero after the after the introduction of zero on a social and cultural level that would be a kind of a historicist mm. argument so the i think the interest he takes for example in um, in the birth of physics in archimedes no so, so there as well the i mean archimedes um was of course handling the zero so, so with his mechanical inventions, he was being a mechanic. He was just being a mechanic, <laughs> but there was not yet um, a symbolical uh, notation system to, to 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 refer to it. But actually, he uh, was very crucial in inventing one because he said, "Okay, we can escalate the numbers." No, so the largest number for which we have a word, I can take it as the basis for a next escalation and again and again. So this is how he could do this fantastic projections in the sand reckoner and so on. So he would affirm a notion of the symbolic, which was decoupled from meaningfulness and through that also from, from religion. Mm -hmm. But it was it only, I call this cryptographically. Yeah? So ex exterior, in an exterior manner, without trying to identify the content, the content or the substance, but learning about it becoming friends with it, become, getting familiarity with something we don't know. I feel like you'll, you will disagree, but in terms of mathematics being an artificial language, now of course mathematics is a universal form of, of knowledge, it's um, a priori, but in terms of the way in which we create the notations, are we not still constructing some form of artificial language which we're applying to something? Or do you think that we're drawing out an implicit reality. What do you mean? What is the problem with the artificiality that you well, are hinting? The way in which we, the language that we use to describe what's going on mathematically is still, I would, I would see it still as an artificial language, even if mathematics itself is still universal. Yeah. Okay. So for maybe in two parts, for Sarah, the um, 
and in, one of the implications of saying I start from after the Big Bang, from saying form and matter are always already mixed, is that there is no nature which wouldn't be artificial, just like there is no artificial manifestation of something that would not also be natural. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so the two are not, they're not a, a dichotomy in that sense. So then the question of whether uh, mathematics is an artificial language or a natural one is not grasping the, the, uh, the, 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 main, the main implications, let's say, of this, of this approach. Okay. And then um, in mathematics, so it's, for example, in, uh, in, in, uh, in antiquity, so in Greek, mathematics literally meant it refers to everything that can be learned. That is what the term literally means. <laughs> so it, it's not tied already like it is now to particular conventions in symbolical notations and so on. And within mathematics, you never speak, you always speak polyglot, so to speak, if, you, if we speak, because we always need to translate between arithmetics, geometry and algebra, at least between these three. So algebra is with the equations, arithmetics is with counting, and geometry is with projection and with, uh, with, with forms. Mm-hmm. And part of the problems of why the historians want to find a kind of a foundation is to reduce these three into um, the predominance either of arithmetics, this is what Frigge, for example, wanted to do, or geometry with the people who go with the constructivism and who say Euclidean's axioms, Euclid's axioms need to be at the basis. Or then um, uh, uh, algebra, pure, pure algebra, which which would be uh, mainly in the in the in the nineteenth century. German idealism is pure algebra. <laughs> so they are never you can never bring them to one point of coincidence. So that's why yes, it's an artificial language, but that doesn't mean it promises con- absolute control. Okay. Rather- that that was that was the point I was sort of grasping for is that even if it isn't an artificial language, there seems to be this overarching way of perceiving things which we're still funneling all our perception through. So there's still a mathematical filter which is viewing the whole world. And I I just wonder if this said does it does sort of address if there would be some alterations of the world if you were viewing it mathematically and you were viewing it non mathematically, or whether or not you can actually view it non-mathematically. Yeah, I think you cannot. So this is also an interesting point. That's why I mentioned Georg Steiner. No? So he picked up this, when I first studied languages, I was so fascinated by Sapir Worf, by this relativism, by all the many languages which in their grammar transport and in, in yeah, realize completely different notions of uh, space and time. I was super fascinated by that. And then, um, and there is a, a similar kind of a, a, a hubris in our understanding with regard to, to linguistic uh, grammars, because of all of the languages that are actually still today spoken. I don't know, maybe it's 50,000 or 100,000, I don't know, but the ones which have actually been studied is a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, in a similar way, like, like language, um, it doesn't, I'm not, I don't want to say our, the, the, the language in which we grow up determines how our head can think, but there clearly is, is, a, is a correlation between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But luckily we can, so it's possible to speak many languages. <laughs> and in mathematics as well, I mean, the language of topology is a different language than that of Euclidean geometry. Mm-hmm. Or the language of, uh, of, uh, of contemporary, I don't know, topos, sheaf theory and algebra is a different language than the fields uh, of Kalwa. In, 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 so they are many languages. Okay. Um, is there anything you'd like to add about the book um, or something you'd like to bring in that we've, uh, we've missed so far? No, I think we covered a lot. There, were, there would be... <laughs> Not more, of course, to, 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 to speak about it in that book, but um, it's, it's a book which needs time <laughs> to read as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Seems like a good place to finish up. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much.